Hi there, my name is Dr. Will Niven. I'm a consultant in emergency medicine at the Homerton Hospital and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how to supervise a trainee that may be wanting to undertake a CESA. Now there are a number of um, objectives to this presentation. I'd like to go through why we should actually care about this cohort of doctors, who they are, um, what their past may be and how they've come to be in this current situation. Understanding the broader context um, of who they are in terms of um, life position, uh, the fact that a lot of them tend to be older and may have different needs from your standard trainee. And following on from that, what the principal challenges are for in, when, when it comes to supervising them. I'd like to talk about what CESAR actually entails uh, and to give a bit of structure around that, how we should approach supervision as educational supervisors and where we can find some additional information um, both as as educators uh, or as trainers and, and for the CESAR trainees themselves. So let's start with why we should actually care. So retaining SAS doctors saves money. Improved skills obviously Im uh, results in, in better outcomes for patients in terms of safety and overall efficiency. These doctors have often operated within the emergency department for quite some time so they're aware of the processes and, and pathways that exist there. They've also got relationships with colleagues from other departments. And this is obviously a massive benefit when it comes to, um, over, again, patient safety, but also in their ability to train and to help and orientate doctors that may be rotating in and out of the department. We obviously would like to have more consultant colleagues to staff a rota. And we want our senior doctors to feel that they're actually developing within their careers. And I think that there's, there's a kindness dimension. We, of course, we want people to do well. We want people to succeed. And here is a link to uh, the toolkit that's been provided by HEE. So moving on to who these people actually are. Some of them are the lost tribe from modernizing medical careers. They, there are a significant number of full-time locums. There are doctors who may have trained uh, through a program elsewhere, particularly Australia, new middle grade recruits that have never actually been in training, and then trainees who want out of training and a bit more flexibility, and then finally portfolio doctors, some of whom may have done things related to medicine like MSF, uh, and others of whom may have um, additional hobbies or interests which have got nothing to do with medicine. The common thread through all of these things is that they want to progress, uh, and they may not necessarily want to do it full time. So a survey was carried out about a year ago looking at um, SAS doctors and trust grades and the difference between these can be in fairly broad brush strokes or as follows. So SAS doctors tend to be associate specialists or staff grades. They generally have had four years postgrad training uh, of which two at least need to have been in speciality and these are potential CESA candidates. Uh, contrasting with this are trust doctors who are non-SAS, uh, generally more junior or FY or post FY2. They're exploring career possibilities and may have an interest in emergency medicine, uh, but are far more likely to eventually go into a tra training program than to be CESA candidates. If we look more specifically at London, 11 out of 18 trusts responded to this. There were 48 SAS doctors and 119 trust grades, so significantly more trust grades than SAS doctors. There had been uh, seven successful Caesars amongst that group, of which I was one of them. Uh, unfortunately, we lacked site-specific information, so we weren't sure which, which trusts had really, un had really created successful Caesar programs, and there was no feedback from the potential candidates. So when we looked at senior middle grave equivalents, uh, the career progression plans were as follows. As you can see on the left hand side there were a few that were planning on entering into higher specialist um, training and then in the second column from the right you can see that there are at least 19 doctors who felt that they were already on a CESAR program. CESAR programs will obviously differ per site and one of the things that we should be striving to do is create a standardized framework through which people can progress uh, their careers and we'd like to learn from sites which have done well and which have been successful and have managed to to get a couple of people onto the specialist register through this route. So a second more detailed survey of SAS doctors was carried out to assess what their top priorities were. And the first thing was that most of them wanted a CESAR support program in some shape or form. 
Secondment provision, particularly anaesthetics and ITU, was high on the list of priorities. Ultrasound and ultrasound sign-off for the FR Chem, leadership and personal development programs, and obviously some exam prep as well. So in terms of what is already going on, uh, this is a recognized HE priority. The Urgent and Emergency Care Collaborative is a task force that has been dedicated to looking at what the issues are and how they can be addressed going forward across London. Each STC should now have a CESA lead uh, at one PA per week. We've looked at, there are a number of trusts which are offering CESA development and again one of the ideas has been that, that certain hubs become um, become experienced in, in mentoring this cohort through and other trusts uh, can learn from, from good practice in these areas. Regionally, NWEL and NCEL have already created and piloted um, programs for the for the non-training middle grades, uh, both of which have been highly successful and and very and w with great feedback from from those that have been trained. And the other good thing is that there are a critical mass of CESA consultants developing across London, and w one of the benefits from that is that this is no no now no longer an an unbeaten path, and there's a huge scope for for existing CESA consultants to be able to mentor junior colleagues through the same process. So let's look at some of the personal factors that are worth bearing in mind when supervising uh, people that may be planning on undertaking a CESA. So the first thing is pride. So most non-training middle grades feel quite correctly that they operate at a level post ACCS and don't really want to go back to start at uh, an ST1 level. They're often personal factors such as owning, owning a home in an area, family commitments, uh, possibly even having small children uh, or, or children in, in uh, primary or secondary school. There is the very real concern that there may be a loss of earnings and what that effect may have on, on a mortgage. Neophobia or fear of the new. Personality issues such as antipathy to authority and bureaucracy, i.e. myself. I uh, undertook a survey a number of years ago um, on people that were non, well, on non-training middle grades. I got 14 respondents and as you can see from, over, from this graph over here, most of these people are at least 30 plus and the majority of them tend to be 40 plus. And as you can see at the bottom, the dark green line over there, a substantial uh, number of them have actually been qualified for 16 to 20 years. I'd like to move on to some of the structural barriers now that these, uh, these doctors face. So I think CESA is an absolutely massive undertaking and there's a huge amount of paperwork that's involved in, in actually completing it. Access to anaesthetics and ITU can also be a potential barrier. Up until recently there hadn't been any um, career progression framework for SAS doctors. And there's an opportunity cost associated with annual appraisal and revalidation. Documenting everything that you're doing over the past year and uploading it to one platform can make uploading the same information to a different platform or filing it in, in a different part of a hard drive or in paper copies a significant uh, obstacle to actually um, doing the CESA paperwork. There are often too few uh, consultants or they are sufficient, they have their hands sufficiently full with their existing trainees that your non-training middle grades or SAS doctors fall down the list of priorities. There's a lack of, we of awareness around which resources can be used to help people in their career progression and the college have now um, provided substantial um, resources which can help CESA candidates. Difficulty with exams, particularly linguistic, um, linguistic uh, challenges can, can mean that people may have actually fallen out of training themselves because they can't get through, through the exam. Minimal entry points to training in a prescriptive training framework means that people don't really want to start right from the beginning at ST1 level or may lack access to anaesthetics and ITU which allows them to enter into ST, ST4. So let's talk a little bit more uh, specifically about supervision issues. You may struggle to actually engage uh, non-training middle grades uh, and, and actually figure out whether they whether CESAR is something for them and whether they, this is something that they want to actively pursue. There are often issues around teaching and training discourse and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that work-based assessments, reflective practice and ARCPs are something that we may take for granted as educational supervisors. 
But if you're a non-trainee who's been uh, operating within an emergency department and, and doing the day job for the last five or ten years, then a lot of these terms may actually be quite foreign to them um, and not part of their general idiom. The other issue is that neither party may know the CESA requirements in the first place and what it actually entails, uh, the absence of a, of a roadmap to navigate them through it, um, other priorities um, or life, life in trace such as actually you know, all I want to do is get my kids through school and have enough money for retirement, uh, CESA may not actually be a priority for me right now. Knowing where to start um, and how to kind of undo this knot can be quite tricky as well. So um, now for the juicy bits, I think one of the, the way that we would approach this is to talk um, is to take take this in stepwise fashion. So the the first thing is really to acquaint yourself with the guidance. Uh, evidence um, required for Caesar basically needs to fulfil the four GMC domains. Um, obviously, this is going to change in the next few years as the new curriculum comes through. But broadly speaking, domain one consists of knowledge, skills, and performance, which is um, providing evidence that the, tra the non-trainee has fulfilled the requirement of the curriculum and has all the necessary skills in order to be an emergency physician. And this is really the, the, the vast majority of the application. You've then got domain two, which is safety and quality, which includes audit and quality improvement. And domain three and domain four, which collectively only take up about 5% and we'll go through some of the things that are involved over there. Here's a list of useful links. At the top is the specialty specific guidance that's been produced by the GMC for emergency medicine and no trainee should undertake this without having fully read the guidance in the first instance. Next up is um, a, a resource pack which the Archem has provided which I think is excellent and, and really kind of lays out a, a very decent framework for how you might go about getting a Caesar. And then in terms of the actual practicalities of and, and how to, there's a blog post which I wrote uh, about a year or so ago which contains a, a Caesar how-to guide. So let's go into a little bit more detail about Domain 1. So Domain 1 incorporates the following, so your qualifications which could be FRChem or FACEM and, we'll, and again I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the test of knowledge in the next slide. Assessments and appraisals are your work-based assessments and now particularly ESLEs of which you need to provide evidence of at least two per year for the last three years. Logbooks I'll talk about in a bit more detail. Details of posts and duties, so for those candidates who have worked at a number of different hospitals, they need to have a letter from HR uh, basically outlining the period of employment and the role uh, under which they were employed. Research and publications, useful things to have in your application, including poster presentations. They need to provide evidence of continuous professional development, meeting the minimum requirement of 50 CPD points per year. And then as regards teaching and training, any PowerPoint presentations that have been done need to be copied at six slides per page and should be accompanied with an invitation to teach, uh, usually in the form of an email. Going into the test of knowledge in a little bit more detail, ideally that would be the FR Chem or FACEM if the candidate comes from Australia. In that instance, they will need to provide a validated copy of the curriculum. If they're unable to get the exam, then there are three other things which may be considered as an alternative for the test of knowledge, and these include extensive teaching uh, across a number of different grades, including student, foundation, core, and higher, a comprehensive CPD record that really kind of shows the assessor that, that the candidate has got a, an in-depth knowledge and understanding of the, the FR Chem curriculum, and then obviously research um, thesis and publications can also help in that regard. So this is what I like to refer to as the protein of the Caesar salad. Uh, traditionally it's chicken but it could also be halloumi and if you're a vegan it could be corn. No matter what your choice of protein however this slide over here would suggest to us that a number of these candidates have successfully engaged with the exam before and certainly passed the first couple of exams within the FR Chem. So with the right uh, environment and with the right support, there's absolutely no reason to suspect that they're not able to progress uh, right through to the end of the FR Chem examination. 
So in terms of the um, next thing, which I think is really important, it's it's that the candidates have an e-portfolio or, or what might be referred to as the Remain lettuce or base upon which you build your Caesar salad. And the specialty specific guidance is really quite clear as to what the sort of um, work based assessments are uh, that are required that the candidate will need to provide evidence of for the application. And so broadly speaking, that is six uh, mini kexes of uh, over the past three years, six case based discussions, and the mini kex and CPD should cover the six major presentations uh, for adults and children. Six of the acute presentations for adults and children, and six DOPSs over the past three years. A minimum of three ACATs and two ESLIs per year for the last three years. Uh, in addition to that, they need to provide evidence of four management portfolio projects. So, I mean, looking at this in aggregate, it, it really is not that arduous. And and again, I think that even as a trainer, these would not be particularly difficult to facilitate and provide over over a couple of years for, for a, a CESAR candidate. This is an example of the logbook template that the RCHEM have provided in Excel format, which can be downloaded from the website. I think it's a really, really useful tool. Uh, the candidates will need to have provided evidence of 50 cases per year with um, each of the following columns filled out. So starting with age and gender, so it has to be, those are the only identi patient identifiers that they're allowed to include. The presenting complaint, final diagnosis, uh, and any procedures that were performed, potential complications of those procedures or areas in which things may have, have not gone according to plan. The role of the candidates, so were they, was this a patient they were seeing in their own right or was this a patient that they were supervising? Outcomes and then uh, crucially uh, in the second to last column from the right hand side some notes and reflections about uh, about the case. It doesn't have to be exhaustive but but three or four lines about what they've learned would be is, is, impor is important to include. And then in the far right column just put the curriculum competence number as well. This slide over here tells us a couple of things. So firstly, that a lot of these candidates are actually already registered with the ePortfolio. So in terms of what you can do as a supervisor is certainly make sure that they're meeting the SSG requirements, but they can also use the ePortfolio as a place to, to log uh, any additional courses, reflections, or their ultrasound, uh, their ultrasound competencies as well. So we should really be encouraging the use of this ePortfolio as a structure through which they're going to um, put together their CESAR application. So there are a couple of tricks to the trade when it comes to CPD. Firstly, the candidate needs to be able to demonstrate that they've covered the full curriculum with their CPD, with their CPD record, and it should cover it should cover the past five years. The more um, in-depth evidence that they have to provide against the various curriculum competencies, the more likely it is that that CPD record will be accepted. Don't assume that the candidates know that things like teaching or e-learning count as CPD as well. So it's quite important to, to sit down with them and explain the full range or the full, the full gamut of, of, of CPD activities that they can actually use to log uh, in, this, in this section. The other issue that often comes up is the fact that when you're doing your CESAR application, there may be evidence which applies in one section but we can also apply to the CPD section. So for example research and publications may include posters that you've presented at conferences but that obviously also counts as CPD and same same scenario with teaching. So teaching has its own section but any teaching that's provided to, to a set of learners can also be used as it can also be used in the CPD um, it can also be used in the CPD section. So in all these situations, I would get them registered with the college CPD diary, which I think is an excellent resource. RCAM learning, for the, particularly for the e-learning modules, really can help the candidate demonstrate that they're covering the curriculum and addressing any, any gaps in their knowledge. Med Twitter, courses that they've attended, conferences, and more is better, but crucially they need to, to reflect on the, on the CPD activity that they've undertaken. And it doesn't need to be exhaustive. A couple of lines for each for each um, CPD credit is more than sufficient. The teaching section 
is there again there are a few things which the candidate needs to demonstrate so firstly any presentation that they've done needs to be uploaded as six slides per page either in a word or a pdf document there needs to be an email confirming an invitation to present or a thank you for the presentation and that gives the assessor an idea that the presentation did actually take place uh, particularly if there's a date on the email a teaching rotor showing that the curriculum has been is being covered or addressed through the department feedback from learners four or five per session is is sufficient and what this uh, what the candidate should do is get into the habit of, of bringing the paper forms to any teaching that they that they give getting the learners to feedback at, at the time and then just scanning those and uploading them into either, either onto the e-portfolio onto the C or onto the CSER application and I would say that each candidate needs to provide evidence of at least 10 teaching sessions though if they don't have the FR Chem or an equivalent test of knowledge then they're going to need to provide evidence of more teaching from um, from students right through to higher specialist trainees so domain two is safety and quality and this is broadly speaking participation in audit service improvement any QI activity undertaken including the FR Chem examination reflective diaries, some of which may actually already be evident in the logbook or in other sections um, in Domain 1, and then any clinical governance activities. In terms of any audits that are undertaken, I, I fell victim to this. Uh, it needs to include, every audit needs to include a definition of the criteria and standards used, some data collection, assessment of performance against the originally uh, designated criteria and standards, identification of changes, so alterations to practice and their implementation and then re-evaluation. And this uh, it needs to be presented either in a, uh, it can be as a poster or it can be in a, a teaching session and a PowerPoint presentation. So evidence that you've disseminated the learning needs to be there as well. And each candidate needs to have gone through the, the, the needs to provide evidence of the five steps for any audits that they've undertaken with a minimum of two to three per application. So when you initially meet with the with the non-trainee or candidate who's planning on doing a CESA, I think it's always useful to get a, a kind of an idea of what their life narrative has been, how they ended up as a doctor and, and what's happened to them, you know, in terms of teaching and, and training that's led to them now wanting to undertake a CESA. I think it's important to find out what they've already accomplished in terms of particularly in terms of secondment so have they been to anesthetics have they got their ITU competencies and if they've been on those secondments what evidence have they got towards the CESAR application any attempts that they've made towards progression so far in my experience there are a lot of people that start a CESAR application and get daunted by the sheer scale of, um, <laughs> of the evidence required for it but the important thing over here is that even if they've only collected 10 to 20 percent of the evidence required it's something and it's it's something that you can work with as an educational supervisor get an idea of you know what they want to, what it is that they want to be where do they want to be do they want to be a consultant in emergency medicine not every non-trainee or, or SAS doctor will necessarily want to do a CESAR and I think it's important to establish uh, you know how they how they kind of see their career going over the next year couple of years you know and and ultimately you know long-term plans Important questions to be asking, do they, do they actually know what a CESAR entails and have they read the specialty specific guidance? Um, so in, if, if they haven't, then I think it's important that you signpost them to those things. Are they going to be doing this full time, part time or as a locum? I think if they are planning on doing a CESAR application, they need to appreciate that the assessors will look at the, far, the past five years and they're going to be interested in the amount of time that, they've, that the candidate has been spent that has, has spent doing emergency medicine. So if they're working at you know 0.6 of a rotor, they're probably not going to have enough evidence for a CESAR. Equally with the locum, if they're doing two days a week in one place, but locuming for three to you know for another three days at a different site, they're going to really struggle to get the evidence together for for the CESAR application. Again, establish whether they've got an e-portfolio, how they've stored their evidence to date. Has it been in paper format, or have they got files on the on their own? Uh, personal computer and then look specifically at how they've actually filed it does it does it have a symmetry with the CESAR application 
uh, with its four domains and various and uh, circa 50 subdomains. Following on from that meeting, I would suggest that you get them to write a PDP and the format of that PDP, um, you know, they can choose, but a suggested a suggested structure would include the ongoing tasks that they need to be doing on a sort of daily or weekly basis, including their logbooks, any work-based assessments, and a, and a continuous record of their CPD. Then we talk about the discrete competencies, such as any secondments that they will need to do um, for anaesthetics, ITU, pediatrics, or acute medicine, and, and map that out over the next year or two. You may need to help them with that. Uh, as you will have access to to various departments and, and their consultants that, that may be able to facilitate this exams and their plan for completing the FR Chem, any checklist of evidence that they already have, and the R Chem provide an excellent document that really allows the candidate to map out the evidence against the curriculum. Uh, again, this can be found on their website. I would suggest at this point that you then schedule a second meeting and set a reasonable timeline for some quick wins. So that might be the gathering of three or four work-based assessments or gathering some feedback from learners to whom the candidate may have taught over the past year or so. Identify any gaps in the plan and that will require you as an educational supervisor to have at least some kind of understanding of what the specialty specific guidance is. Get the candidate to um, really establish some, some good habits and that would, be, that would include things like making sure that they get a work-based assessment every week or two, or logging cases, interesting cases that they've seen and reflecting on them in the, in the logbook that has been provided. I say strategize with the evidence. It's important to point out to the candidate that they don't need to collect all the evidence at once. This you know, needs to be gathered over, ideally prospectively over a couple of years. So they may be daunted by the idea of starting a quality improvement project. You know, leave that. Leave. They may want to leave that for a few months to a, to a year before they get started with that. And then, in terms of incentivizing, I would I would generally say that if this is somebody who you've struggled to engage with, they may say, "Look, what I really want is a secondment to anaesthetics and ITU." And I don't think it's completely unreasonable to say, "Well, if you manage to get these these quick wins over the next couple of months." then this is something that we can maybe discuss for, you know, for February or for August next year. In terms of ongoing supervision, uh, this is not unlike what you would do for, for, a, for a trainee. So ensuring that they're doing their work-based assessments, documenting all the educational supervisor meetings, ideally every three months. This is all really good evidence which can be used in the application. Monitoring PDP progression. So this is this is twofold. This is obviously making sure that the the trainee is sticking to the plan, but also is a real opportunity for you to encourage them and to say, well, look, you know, it's fantastic. You got you completely accomplished your PDP over the over the past three months. You've now got you know 15 to 20 percent of the evidence, and in six months you'll have 40 percent of it. There should be a yearly structured trainee report preferably an ARCP equivalent with, with a couple of other doctors that have gone through the portfolio. And then the other thing that you can do is oversee any teaching or clinical governance activity that they've done and provide evidence for the application that these tasks have been carried out. One of the crucial things that does that, that candidates struggle with is, is showing evidence of, of reflection and so, you know, you should be really encouraging them to do that around the CPD or any teaching that they've delivered or any e-learning that they've undertaken. And then the last thing that I put in there is pastoral support. This is a really big task for them to undertake. And, you know, often an arm around a shoulder and a, and a bit of kindness goes a long way to, to maintaining momentum or just to getting, getting them to pick themselves up and, and dust themselves off after you know, a setback in an exam or something along those lines. Here are some general considerations. So the first thing I put in there is always be transparent with the trainee. Resources are limited and secondments may, may not always be immediately available. But if you say that you're going to provide something in February or in August, then really you should do you should move mountains to make sure that it happens. Be realistic. This is going to take a lot of time, and a lot of it may be unpaid time in which they, uh, which they take to file their evidence. I think that it's completely reasonable to offer um, SPA time as an incentive if they if they accomplish some of those quick wins that you've that that we talked about a couple of slides earlier. 
the educational supervisor meetings that you've had are going to end up being really good evidence um, for the trainees for the candidates application so keep a good record of, of any meetings that you've had with them advocate and cheerlead and think about the network uh, you may not have somebody at your in your department who's done a CESA, but there may be someone in the neighboring trust and each STC now has a CESA lead as I've mentioned earlier Finally, I would say do not get the candidate to submit their evidence until they've got the vast majority of it. This, the process of actually uploading the evidence and making sure that they've you know, got enough evidence against the various domains takes some time. And what they don't want to be in a situation of is, is where they're still gathering evidence at a time that they're trying to, to get their application through. I've got, I go into this in a lot more detail in the blog post that I sent the link to earlier. So every Caesar salad needs some dressing, in this case narrative, which every candidate is provided with in a column to the, um, to the right of the evidence that they're actually uploading. And the narrative in this situation is an opportunity for the candidate to explain what the evidence is and how it meets the requirements of the specialty specific guidance. As, as someone, as an, edu as an educational supervisor, I would strongly suggest that you go through that spreadsheet with the with the candidate prior to them actually submitting the application because you may find that there are certain things which are missing uh, fundamental things are missing from application before it goes through some frequently asked questions what about less than full time well as far as i understand it at this stage they will uh, the assessors will look at the last five to six years of evidence uh, which is going to be it's going to be very challenging for someone who's working less than a full-time rotor to to get all the evidence necessary for a CESA application. How much time per secondment? Well basically that it ends up being 400 hours per speciality so 400 hours for anesthetics, ITU and pediatric emergency medicine. That can be accomplished through a full-time rotor over a period of three months or if it was going to be done part-time with nights and weekends in the emergency department you might it might need to be stretched out to two to six months but the key in this situation is that they can provide evidence through a rotor that they've done at least 400 hours within that speciality acute medicine um, competencies can actually be got through the emergency department and don't require a, a, a dedicated secondment uh, the same applies for major trauma experience. They don't need to have been at a major trauma center, but they're going to need to provide the work-based assessments or the CPD record that shows that they've got sufficient experience in that area. What if there's no logbook with the 50 cases per year, including you know procedures done and, and reflections on, on the, the case? There are a couple of ways that this can be approached. Either they can retrospectively look at, at cases over the past three years uh, based upon a hospital IT department printout of cases that have been seen. Alternatively, they can get the that same printout from the hospital IT department, ensure that it's been properly anonymized, so the only identifiers are age and gender, and then provide a summary of, of the cases that they've seen uh, as an alternative form of, of evidence. But there is a lot more evidence on the logbook now than there was two or three years ago, so I would really encourage the trainee to get into the habit of, of keeping one. How many audits and quips? Well, when I was doing my application, it was a minimum of three, and again, those need to go through the five steps that were outlined earlier. They can use the FRCM quip as evidence in this particular section. Do I need evidence for all the subdomains? Um, no, you don't, because the application will be reviewed in its entirety. So if there if there is missing evidence in you know, so if there are only kind of four or five teaching presentations, but the candidate has done 100 hours CPD per year for the last three or four years, then those two things will probably balance themselves out. Finally, people tend to have questions about what's going to happen with Curriculum 2020. And whilst we're not 100% sure what the content of the new curriculum is going to be off post-ratification from the GMC, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the evidence that is currently being gathered towards the CESA application with the old system will, will still map to the various SBC domains of the new curriculum. So that um, concludes my presentation. Uh, my email is william.niven at nhs.net if you have any further queries. 
and I hope this has been useful. Thanks very much.